I imagine most of you are probably on Twitter. So feel free to take photos and uh, post it on Twitter. Use hashtag FOSTEM, F-O-S-D-E-M. Let's get trending on Twitter. Because there's no actual official registration, FOSTEM is, doesn't really have a, a good exposure like in uh, Lanyard and websites like that. We should make it like a trend. Okay, so this slide is about continuous integration at a distribution level. And here we are with Martin Pitt. Martin Pitt uh, works with Ubuntu, I guess. Uh, he works on Linux plumbing upstream and in Debian, Ubuntu, systemd and stuff like that. And have created and maintained the distro level CI in Ubuntu. Please welcome Martin for the talk. So welcome everyone, and yeah, it's a pleasure to speak in front of so many people, I'm overwhelmed. And of course, lots of thanks to the FOSTEM organizers and the volunteers, it's a great conference, so thanks a lot. So yeah, I've been an Ubuntu developer since pretty much its inception in 2004, and a Debian developer even longer, so a long time. And in Ubuntu, we have practiced continuous integration at the distribution level, that is, we do test-based gating for like the 30,000 packages that we ship. And as far as I know, we are still today the only major distro which does it with that rigor, like test-based uh, gating of, uh, of the development of the, well, the uh, distribution. And so I want to share some thoughts and experiences and maybe convince you that it's a good idea. So what I'm going to do, so I first why did we do this? And, and then how, how do our tests look like these days? How do we use them for gating? And then I want to lose a couple of words about the infrastructure where we run all this, because at this scale, you imagine it's not exactly easy. And then how did it change our life doing all this? And then we should have about 10 minutes of Q&A. So where did we come from? In the first few years of Ubuntu, we had this six-month development cycle, and in the first uh, four months, this was basically the anything goes, toss everything over the fence, feature, de feature development. And then we hit feature freeze, and in the remaining one and a half, two months, we tried to fix about half of the regressions that we introduced in the first four. And during that time, when we met as a developer running the development release, it became kind of a daily morning exercise to uh, fix your broken boot or fix your broken X or try to restore half of the packages that your upgrade uh, removed underneath you because you weren't paying attention. So while you learned a lot about how all the system worked, it was certainly not a very enjoyable uh, experience for non-developers. And as a result, we did not have a lot of non-developers using the de development release. And as a result of that, we were losing a lot of potential feedback for how the development series worked in real life scenarios. We didn't get non-critical bug reports, and as a result, a lot of aggression crept into the stable release. And another problem was that in the distribution, you are facing a lot of archive-wide changes. Things like library transitions, or introducing a new Qt, or major Python version. So back then, these things were often not finished. People basically toss them over the fence, half done, saying, oh my god, I have this uh, deadline to make, or there's feature freeze next week, so let's dump it all in and sort it out later. And in the event, it became a someone else's problem. And usually in the end, the release team had to clean up all these bits and kick out packages and desperately rebuilding packages against the ABI, and it was just a horrible mess. So once Ubuntu became popular enough, and was being used in mission critical, mission critical deployment and commercial products, this was simply not good enough anymore. So we set down like a, a strict goal. The development series must be stable and usable and safe to be used at all times. Nobody is able to knowfully break it anymore. And so by using this kind of continuous testing, continuous integration, we basically want to ratchet towards perfection. We never ever wanted to have a bug which we can automatically detect uh, land in the development release. And uh, yet another problem was that the many upstreams already have test suites. 
It's just that like every project does them differently, so there is no uniform and thus automatic way to actually run them in the distribution at the time when you need So that was the situation. So initially, like everyone else, we started with some rather naive approaches. So we set up a QA team and that created a, several iterations of standalone test suites like Ubuntu desktop tests, Ubuntu server tests and whatnot, tossed them into Jenkins and run it every day, and then basically pestering people about, you broke the tests and please fix it. And of course, none of that really worked because uh, it's too late. I mean, at that point when they detected it, the damage was already done. Also, it's this never ending blame game like developers pointing to QA, but it's your tests that are broken, and QA pointing to developers, no, it's a software that broke. Also, none of that was really reproducible and easy to like, replicate for a developer. So the conclusion from that was, the only people who are able to be responsible for the test in a meaningful way are the developers of the very software. So developers are responsible for testing, they're responsible for gating, and the QA team basically only does the infrastructure and making sure that the test results actually arrive and provide some kind of consulting to people. Like if someone has a question, how do I simulate, I don't know, a Wi-Fi card or XO or whatnot, then the QA team could help you with that. But it must be possible for every developer to reproduce tests easily without reading lots of manual pages. So the idea was, instead of having these centralized tests, we would put the actual test for a source package in the source package itself, where developers can like, develop them by themselves and they don't need to go to any QA process. And these tests would then be triggered when the, either the software itself or any of its dependencies would get up there. And we, of course, would use these tests for actually gating, so once these tests break, the package doesn't land, period. And this was an auto package test. This is both the name of like this whole kind of test and it's also the name of the tool that you actually run to, 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 to execute the test. And back then it was submitted as a Debian Enhancement Proposal number 8, which is why you can still hear a lot of people calling them Deb 8 tests, so don't be confused. How do these look like? So this is the, one of the simplest and oldest tests that we still have in the archive. So it's the kind of toy example where you, where you begin. So every source package which with test needs to have a Debian test control, which gives the test metadata. Basically, it enumerates all the tests that we have, and it says, like, in order to run the, the simple gzip tests, we need to have these and these packages installed. And you can also give other properties, but I'm going to this later, and this one doesn't need anything. And so for every test that you enumerate there, simple gzip, you need to have an accompanying Debian test slash test name. And if you see here, this can be very simple. It's basically a smoke test that gzip and gunzip does what we expect it to do. And so the contract is, um, if the test that you run uh, exits with zero, then it's passed and otherwise it's failed. So you can write the test in any language, you can compile it if you wish, and so that keeps you pretty flexible as a developer. So once you have the test, how do you run them? So this is the auto package test program. This is the thing responsible for creating a temporary test bed. Copy the test inside that, run it, um, make sure that all the logging is right, you get the results back and any kind of artifacts back. And you can influence the final behavior of the test, but details aren't there. And there is a, it supports various um, backends there, which you can run the test in. So one of the oldest ones that we have is like a Chirut, which you see like in the second row here. Like Chirut is basically Debian's tool to manage, uh, build and manage a couple of Chiroots. So very simple. Uh, but of course, this kind of limits uh, the things you can do. So you can't start services, you can't interact with the kernel, because that doesn't work in Chiroots. So after we created all the package tests, these new fancy technologies came along, QEMU, containers, whatnot. So these days, we have backends for LXC, LXC, QEMU, arbitrary SSH hosts, or cloud instances, and ADB, if you want to run something on Android. And these days in production, we're actually using um, Kimu uh, by way of using OpenStack instances. 
So you have a full virtual machine to mess around with. And we use that for x86s and the Power 8. And for the other two architectures, ARM and S390, which we support, we run them in Galaxy because we don't have OpenStack integration yet. So a slightly more useful example is a schema that we use into, in a lot of libraries. So we basically do a simple compile link run cycle to make sure that the library that we ship or update still works. So this is a simple test metadata. Should be straightforward, I hope. And this is what the test does. Basically, it creates a simple C file, which, like in this case, it interfaces with systemd's uh, logindy. So we instantiate a logindy monitor, call it, and basically make sure that the smoke test is right. Then we call GCC on it and run the program. And like, if it succeeds, the test is good. So at first sight, this looks very simple. But on second look, there's actually lots of things that can go wrong. Yeah? So for example, if we update the program to the uh, so upstream version and our development package is missing to specify a new dependency. So it's trying to use a header file, which is just, just not there. Or it actually forgets to install new header files. Or like the package config file is wrong and we did have new upstream versions which ship with a broken package config. Like all of that happens. So as I said, you see the same pattern in lots of libraries in Debian and Ubuntu these days. So it is useful. And a more like intricate example um, is the, for example, the one from, from our system D package where we run an upstream test. So upstream ships a test slash network D test of pi, which well exercises network D. And as I said, normally the test needs to live in Debian slash test, but with the test directory clause, we can say that the test is to be looked at in a different directory. So in this case, test slash network D test pi. And this is a way how we can interface and run upstream tests by saying basically just giving the metadata for the test, and that's it. And you also see the new restrictions column here. So this is where you can say like how well isolated does my test bed needs to be. So in this case, we need to have root, and we also need to run it at least in a container because network D, you need to set, a couple, set up a couple of VEs and start services, and for example, this wouldn't be safe to run it into root. And there is one, uh, like a, a stronger version of that would be in uh, isolation machine, which we, for example, use in the network manager test. Uh, that loads a kernel module, like Mac 802.11hw sim, which simulates Wi-Fi devices. And this is the kind of stuff that doesn't work in the container. Also, our kernel tests, they do really nasty things to the test bed and beat them to a pulp. And so you really want to nicely contain this in the VM. It's just not safe in the container. But I don't actually want to go too much into the details of, of that. I just want to give a broad overview of what's possible there. For example, in systemd, we have tests which simulate a suspend for seeing how logging works or closing and opening of the lid. Or we create a, with SCSI debug, we create a loops partition to make sure that systemd integrates this properly. Or we install a couple of the same mission critical packages like dbus, network manager, or XORG and LightDM and make sure that with every new system you upgrade, everything starts and there are no failed services and that you can reboot the test at 20 times without failures. So, that said, when we started this in like 2012 or so, we still had a very few tests, as you see. And then we started to introduce this into Debian. And since 2014, I'm quite happy that Debian also runs these tests except that it doesn't uh, use them for gating it. And you see the adoption curve is really nice. Uh, these days we have more than 6,000 packages which have auto package tests. And considering that you also cover their dependencies implicitly, that's quite a nice coverage already. I mean, it's still far away from the 30,000, but it points into the right direction. By the way, the, the big leap that you see here was kind of sort of cheating, so we figured out how a, a generic way to test Perl and Ruby and DKMS modules, because they all look very similar, so we have a central way to run them, and so that explains the nice job. So, now that we have the tests, how do we use them for game? Initially, there's a developer who prepares a new package update, say, GDK. 
and uploads it to the distribution. That happens with dput. That's just the standard Debian tool to, to upload a package. But this does not land directly in the Ubuntu development series, but instead it goes into something which we call the proposed pocket. And this is a kind of an overlay on top of the development series where all the new stuff is being uploaded. And it acts as a staging area for basically CI. And this one has no human users because by definition that's the bit that is broken. And then we have a thing called proposed migration set of scripts. If you are from a Debian background, you might also know it as uh, Brittany. And this then does all the necessary checks on it. So it tests that the new GDK builds on all the architectures where we expect it to, that it is installable everywhere, that it doesn't break installability of other packages. So we do this for all the 30,000 packages and that ensures that like uh, library transitions can only be complete and you don't know, knowingly introduce uninstallability. And for the purpose of this talk, it also triggers tests, both of GDK itself and everything that uses GDK, like all the reverse dependencies. And only once all of that is good, uh, proposed migration then lands either GDK itself or the group of packages that are kind of belong together into the development series. And with all of that, we ensure that packages in develop, they never regress on architecture support, they are always installable, and in theory at least, the tests never regress. Well, that's uh, the theory part, but for the most part it works. And so, of course, in this case, uh, if GDK breaks something, the developer then might need to do further uploads to adjust GDK users to like new API or whatnot. So, and this is a page which we automatically generate where developers can check the status of their packages. So instead, in, in this example with GDK, uh, we, for example, see here that like, it didn't build on Power PC64 yet, and on i386 it has an uninstallable binary package, and that like, one reverse dependency Unity just failed the test. So this is a very simplified output, so normally we test on five different architectures and not just one. And also, we wouldn't actually start the test before we know that the package builds an installable, because otherwise it's pointless, but like it should illustrate the point. And this is actually still a very simple case. Consider updates of GLT, Python, Perl, or apt, and they literally trigger thousands of tests. Like every time we upload GLT, we trigger 5,000 tests times five architectures. So our machinery takes like about two days to grind to that. But the nice thing is after these two days, you can actually then this stuff with confidence. Instead of just saying, yeah, I hope that it breaks nothing because it, it always does. <coughs> and of course, the exact same thing applies to updates of stable releases as well. So it's the exact same thing. People upload to, let's say, Xenial proposed. Xenial is our current LTS. And then it goes through all this machinery. And only if it's green, we can actually publish it. So that's the structure of the test. I want to explain a little bit the infrastructure and where we run this both because I haven't really seen this kind of structure anywhere else, and also, to be completely honest, I'm a little bit proud of it. So, like many other people, we of course started with Jenkins. And that was okay when we had like 20 tests in the beginning, but already then it was quite brittle when every update of Jenkins, then you read through these three screenfuls of Java exceptions, and it's pretty hard to maintain, and it's really not easy to replicate locally if you want to develop the infrastructure. And we got a lot of losing test requests, and it's a single point of failure. And at a scale of 30,000 packages, it just doesn't work. So we needed something better. So I sat down the other day and designed something on a micro service architecture, which should use standard cloud technology as far as, as, far as possible. And I wanted to have small and loosely connected components. So where it starts is what we could call a policy entity. So this is a thing which wants to trigger tests, and then wait for the result, and then making decisions on the, based on these test results. This can be a proposed migration that I was just explaining for the distro, but it could also be GitHub, for example, where you want to use it for gating pull requests. And there's a couple of other consumers <coughs> about that, for that. And the only thing that this policy entity does is it puts test requests into an AMQP queue. 
So we use uh, Rabbit for that, which is basically standard implementation. For those who don't do MTP, like very simply, it is a job distribution system. So you have a couple of queues where you can put in requests, and then consumers can take out the requests. And MTP ensures that all of this is very robust. It is atomic. You can arbitrarily parallelize it. And it is a very simple API. So basically, a consumer of that, uh, if you want to retest test requests and do your thing and then acknowledge the result, and it's basically five lines of Python, or you can do it in a single line of, of shell. And like NQP system ensures atomic, uh, atomicity, or if anything breaks uh, and the request doesn't get fully processed, it gets punted back to the queue, and the next consumer basically re attempts it. So, what it does in our case, we have a, a bunch of workers up there. And they basically take requests from the queues that they can service. So we have workers for x86, for example, and then separate set of workers for, for PowerPC because these tests run on a different cloud. So you configure the workers a little differently depending on like, what kind of service they can support. So they take the request, build an auto package test command line, run the test in the cloud, copy back the results, and store them in a permanent thing, which is Swift in this case and then at the end acknowledge the request. And if anything goes wrong in the middle, it goes back to the queue and you never lose a test request. And like at the moment we have many dozen of these parallel workers so that it can scale with the, the size of the infrastructure and it's quite painless to set up. And for those who don't know Swift, this is basically OpenStack's standard, like OpenStack developers forgive the simplification, but it's basically a distributed network file system. It has a simple REST API for querying and uploading, and downloading is basically you get someone on URL and you can watch it in your web browser or download with a curl or URL loop or anything. So it's, and it's pretty simple to use because it's a standard component of the cloud. I, as a consumer of the cloud, don't need to worry about it, and it's separate from all the instances you, you, you set up, so it's basically the, the data is safe there. And finally, once the, once the logs and our artifacts are in Swift, then the original requester can poll for the results and wait for the test results to arrive and then do its decision, and the loop is closed. And finally, there's also a web UI, this results browser, which uh, developers can use. Um, it presents the test results, and you have links to the artifacts and logs and whatnot, and you have all the nice history. So it's mostly a developer tool, but it's completely independent of the workers and um, yeah, and the, the, the policy entity, so it's replaceable and it's non-critical. And the whole infrastructure uh, has some Juju charms, so that's basically Ubuntu's way of cloud deployment management. So it's very simple to deploy all of this into three local LexD containers, and with the exact same one command line, you can also deploy it into production on, say, OpenStack. And I can redeploy the entire infrastructure within minutes without using any data. And yeah, the whole thing is maybe two or three hundred lines, two or three hundred lines of code, so which is about the same size as a single XML job for Jenkins. Just saying. <laughs> so now we have all this. How did it change our life? It, perfect, uh, it provides an effective carrot and sticks for developer. The carrot is, of course, as a developer, the better you make your tests, the harder it is for other people to break your software because of this reverse dependency <coughs> triggering. For example, new kernels have a tendency to break Lexi like or AppArmor or newer X libraries or servers have a tendency to break Qt and in turn, newer versions of Qt tend to break KDE. And in every Ubuntu, we have tons of KDE tests, so our Qt maintainer always has a hard time to land new Qt versions. And I guess they are swearing on this all time. But as I said, once you actually get it to green, then you can land it with confidence. And that's nice. The other effect is that these cross-package changes I mentioned, library transitions and so on, they either land completely or not at all. They will be forever stuck and proposed if you don't uh, finish it all the way through. And this both ensures that you always have a good development series, and it also makes the release team's life much more easy. And of course, as a developer, you can whine all the thing all the time you want against the machine. But I have this deadline, I need to meet feature freeze and whatnot. 
uh, machine is very patient and it won't give you anything, so you need to do your job properly. But of course, like there is no free lunch that comes with the cost. As a developer, if you have a large amount of tests, then you need to keep the tests actually running. And for the most part, that's of course, they can break with new upstream versions or changes to code. But sometimes they also break for entirely unrelated reasons. Like sometimes the cloud configuration changes or an external website that you are talking to in your test changes or goes down, in which case it's probably an actual regression in your software. But still, I mean, people are chasing a lot of test regressions which are not entirely obvious at first. And of course, also having test infrastructure which is able to process tests at this scale is not entirely free. So we are basically building a reliable CI service on top of an, like, naturally unreliable pool of hardware and clouds. So you need to invest a little bit on keeping that running. I mean, this fine gentleman over there took over the maintenance of that and he can probably tell you a lot of the gory details of tracking down curl loops and whatnot. <clears throat> and our, uh, another big problem that we face in the Ubuntu as a downstream is uh, we import a lot of broken tests in Debian. As I said, we have so many tests now and most of them come straight from Debian, but Debian doesn't gate yet, so eventually uh, the failures land on us. For example, every new Ruby version that we import tends to break two or three modules, and in Ubuntu we just don't have the manpower or quite honestly the interest of tracking them down, so we just tend to ignore those. But by and large, after a few months of using this, people got used to it and nobody really discusses the, the if anymore. I mean, people do see the value. And so the thing that we do discuss about is tweaking the policy and uh, making tweaks to the infrastructure or maybe discussing how to add a new architecture to it and so on. So in general, I think people feel a lot more safe that way. So. And that works really great for software which is native to Ubuntu, where we are the upstream. Say, Installer or Juju or Unity or whatnot, or, or Snappy. But as I said, it doesn't work so well when we are just a downstream. So of course these tests find bugs and keep them from landing in the development series all the time. But we then need to deal with them and fall bugs upstream and work on patches and so on. Are we doing this? But it points out that running them in Ubuntu only is too late for most of the bits because in Ubuntu most of the code in Ubuntu just basically happens to us against the form. So what we really need to do is to push all of this upstream. So tests are already running in Debian. Um, we see here KWIN failed like sometime like half a year ago and nobody notices because nobody gets the output in Debian. But there's work on the way to actually enable dating in Debian as well. And yeah, then this will be a lot nicer. But the real place where you want to hook this in is upstream. I'm heavily involved in the systemd uh, community as a developer, both upstream and downstream. And back then, when we had to do an upstream release of systemd, uh, it took me like a week or two to figure out all the test regressions that it caused once I packaged the new upstream release. And it's a big pain point. So one of these days, I tweaked our package to be able to to, to build an unmodified upstream source directly from a pull request without any patches and then adjust the tests so that they would drop some Debian of winter specific expectancies. And so that we are basically able to run our downstream systemd tests straight on the upstream source and then integrated all of this with GitHub. I mean, GitHub is a wonderful webhooks interface which makes it quite easy to interface with. So that nowadays every pull request needs to uh, needs to pass exactly these tests. So this is an example of where things go wrong. And this is now developer's heaven. Because when this happens, the change is still fresh in the developer's mind. It won't land until it's all fixed. And as a result of that, every commit and by extension, every release of systemd is buildable everywhere. It passes the tests. And it has, we have good releases finally. And so that easily, that enables things like daily PPAs. So basically, I have a script which takes common master, applies the Debian patches, runs the test, uploads it to the PDA if anything, if everything is great. And so it's fairly safe to use these daily builds because we know it's not going to break your computer. And basically, packaging a new upstream release now becomes an exercise in writing a good changelog, which is really the thing where you want to be at. 
And this is not really limited to system D, so this is generic facility. Um, we can interface with other projects on GitHub. Of course, it's always a capacity issue, and you need to negotiate the exchange of some credentials. But by and large, this is possible. OK. Well, thanks for your attention. So we still have uh, yeah, a couple minutes left for questions. And if we don't manage to do it here, grab me in the hallway or write me an email or find me on our IC. I am happy to talk about this stuff. I love it. So basically, if, for example, you upload a new GDK, which breaks the old Unity, and you then upload a new Unity, which depends on the new GDK, then um, this Britney script is able to figure out, like, GDK is uninstallable, Unity is uninstallable, but both together are installable, and both together, if I run the tests of the new Unity against the tests of the new GDK, then it's green, and then it lands them both as a group. So basically, if you do a library transition of Python 3.5 to 3.6, you will get like a thousand uploads in station for post, and once you fix the last one, it all lands as a giant chunk. And this is the real point, so to get these cross-package uh, updates done in an atomic and safe way. And this involves a lot of reasoning about dependency trees, and it's all a bit of black magic. I didn't write this, so this is the work of Debian mostly from Niels, and I'm very happy that we could just reuse this. So Debian does use that part also. So stuff that migrates from unstep to testing, it also only lands if library transitions are complete and like packages built and installable, but it doesn't do the test. So with the with the test stash to get run. Ah. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, with the test stash to get run by the Debian test control file, uh, how do you personally feel about the distinction between tests that are testing the upstream code versus test and testing the code as it's packaged and deployed on the system. So do you care whether the tests are run against the, the code as it's put into the package locations or do you mind if it's only run against the unpacked source tree? I'm not sure whether I got it, but so the, the only thing we, all the package tests is the actual binaries that are in the archive. So you upload something to develop well, a host, and that gets a couple of dabs, and they get installed into an actual system, and you only run those. Yeah, so you test the actual installation of the, yes. the binaries, yes. But when the, um, the test suite itself is run, it's often testing a, um, a source tree of the, of the upstream code, not the actual installed version. They can be the same version, but it's actually not the same file. Oh, you mean if you run like a make check kind of thing? Yeah, because you're actually inside yes. the developer environment at that point. Now, they, they should be the same thing. You haven't actually got the assurance, that because a lot of the test harnesses that we need to use can't actually test in slash user slash dim. Uh, they have to test in an unprivileged location. Right. So the question is, when you try to run upstream tests, which are designed to run against the build tree yeah. instead of the system, how do you do this? And this is in, indeed like one of the challenges. So if you have told, like if you have your own thing like here, this will test the system install package. This is not against the source tree. But if you have packages upstream which are only run, run in the my check kind of style, you have to modify them to use the binaries installed in the system because otherwise. Testing the build tree is not testing enough. You might have a perfectly well running build tree, but then mess up the packaging. So, for example, you forget to actually install a file. So the tests need to run what's in the system. Depending on the test, that's simply not always possible. Sure. I mean, for some upstream tests, it's, it's, it's easy to do. Like you, you introduce like a, a path arrival or maybe a dash install test or something. Even automake has a make install check interface, but not a lot of upstream software uses that. 
So if it's easy to change the upstream test suite to run against the system, then of course it's always preferable to use that. Sometimes it's hard, and I would say then just write a smoke test. So the point of that is not really to exercise all the little gory details of your API. That's what unit tests are for, and this is fine to run and make check. The point of that is to test integration and packaging so that you can write your own, let's say, smoke test, which only makes sure that the package by and large works. Let's say for Apache, you install the package and you put like a var www index HTML and you do a w get and make sure that you get back the file you expect. So and this is actually, in this case, uh, maybe an easier approach. But I hope that since more and more people are doing this, upstreams are more um, like willing to take patches which make your test suite run against the install system as well. For example, GNOME has this for a while with the install test. And for example, the glib package actually has a binary which has glib install test, which you can just install and run because they were doing the same thing in OS3, for example. So it becomes more popular. But it is, it is a, like a problem, yeah. Yeah, and it's not the problem that you're currently trying to monitor or, or look at the actual yeah. test um, control script file and, and work out whether they're trying to do that. Yeah. Um, it's, it's left to the maintainer to do, to do that. Yes, yeah. that's right. So there are, the, yeah, there is a potential problem there with the gating that you're using. Because yeah. sometimes the gate is actually operating against not what you think it is. Okay. Yeah. Whether that's taken into account or not. And I must say, I mean, even if you actually just run the upstream test suite against your build tree, that's still better than doing nothing at all, because it still gives you the thing that you, if your dependency changes, and then your build doesn't work anymore, because, for example, Q changes API, you have a K win, and it doesn't build anymore, it still points that out, and it holds back the new Q until you fix K win. So it's useful, it's just not, let's say, using the full extent of what it's supposed to do, but these ripple tests are definitely useful by themselves. And in fact, that's what KDE actually do. So they only basically run a check. And yeah, that's okay. There's one question right here. Ah, uh -huh. So um, lately, more and more programs are using multi-core. And uh, the test suite are, in some cases, uh, going to generate some intermittent issue. So how do you manage those? And in say multi -core? Intermitt intermittent issues, like in the test suite. So sometimes it's going to work, sometimes it won't. Mm -hmm. I know that it's ugly, but it's a reality for yeah. some software. So these are always our favorites, of course, and Me this too. happens a lot. So, I mean, like everyone else, if it fails like one out of ten cases, quite frankly, we push the reach by button, and the, uh, like in reality, the, the report that we have here, this actually has little recycle icons behind regressions, so a developer can just reach by their own test. If it happens like one out of 10, it's okay-ish. If it happens more, then someone should actually sit down and debug it. So yeah. And as I said, I mean, the point of this is it needs to be really easy to reproduce the test locally. So basically with these all the package test command lines that I did, uh, that I showed, these. Um, there is tools which build VM images for you, standard VM image, images, which are basically almost the same than our cloud images or we have tools to build these standard containers, and there's existing tools to build your roots, and there's not a really a lot of steps towards reproducing them yourself. And this has switches, for example, the test shell, when the test fails, then you get a, you can SSH into the test set and then debug your test and cycle faster. And yeah, this is basically the, the daily gory bit of what the developer needs to do to fix their test, because broken tests are useless. Um, anyone else? Okay. There's one over there. there. Oh, yeah. Okay, I'll come here after this. Can you tell a bit about the underlying compute hardware uh, to support all this? I'm sorry, I can't understand you. Huh? Can you tell a bit about the underlying compute farm that, to do all this? The compute farm? Oh, uh, yeah. The infrastructure? Yeah. So we run all of this on. So x86 and PowerPC, we run on, oh, okay. Uh, the question was, can I tell a little bit about the, the build farm that we use? So we have currently three OpenStack installations in Canonical, where basically whenever we have hardware, we toss it in there. And uh, so we currently have, I think, 70 or so power workers for x86, so they can serve i386 and AMD64, and about 28 power workers for PowerPC. 
And as I said, for ARM and uh, IBM Z series, we can't run them in VM sets, so we use LXC containers for those. And basically, you need to scale them to the degree where the maximum possible uh, queue line is still parallel. So of course, this is a this basically determines the delay that you're going to face when you try to land big updates like GDC. So and obviously, if you design it so that you can run GDC in half a day, then most of the time your infrastructure will just be there doing nothing. So this is the capacity issue. And as I said, we not just run distro tests, we also run tests for PPAs, and we also run tests for upstreams, and they all need to share the same <coughs> thing. So this is indeed a bottleneck. For those, you can basically never have enough. So as a developer, you need to be a little patient sometimes. I mean, if you have the least package, it's fine. It can go through in like an hour. But for GDC, well, there is no fast updates of GDC. Yeah. But I mean, in return, like the, the more tests you trigger, the more important your package is, and the more the gaining confidence aspect becomes. So, because if you upload GDT, it breaks three packages, which nobody looks at, and you aren't going to discover this until you release. And so it's worth doing that. I'm not sure whether this was your question or you have more specific ones. But, but yeah. So the point is you run it on OpenStack so that maintaining the infrastructure is someone else's problem. I don't want to maintain the data center. This is IS's job, and they do this fantastically. And by and large, as a consumer, I do Nova, Nova Boot and Nova Delete, and I'm happy to get money out. And it just magically happens in the bank. So who had a question here? In your control file, you had isolate uh, container, isolation container. Uh, this one? Yes, exactly. So, what, how, how is it like a keyword, or you have to find another control file to define the container? And no, these are fixed keywords. So these are defined capabilities in the other package test project. So all of these need root isolation container, and there's a couple of others. They have fixed needs. I mean, sometimes we need new ones, um, but uh, yeah. So they basically say if you try to run this test in the true root, they will just skip and say, "Sorry, your test bed doesn't have container isolation." And likewise, if you try to run the network manager test on LXC, it will say, "Sorry, it's not a full machine," so it gets skipped. So it's basically safe. And well, if you do try to run it on your own machine, then it will do bad things. So yeah. So if you want a new one, then you need to talk to like the other package test guys like me, or, and then we need to define a new one. And it does happen. Any other question here? Uh, There's one person. Ah. Hello, do you have some infrastructure to handle complex applications and, for example, desktop applications? There's no, sorry? Uh, do you have some infrastructure to handle tests of complex applications or uh, desktop applications, which, for example, interact with user in some cases? For and example, you can uh, bump uh, GDK for one minor version, and for example, in one minor version, they change the location of uh, uh, the uh, character modules. Just change the location in minor release. They, they are all bundled test path, which they try to uh, supply with the package. But uh, your system application just don't uh, handle encoding. Mm -hmm. Correctly. Do you have some tests for um, desktop user applications? Yeah, we, so I'm afraid I didn't get the whole question, but I think it was about uh, how do we test desktop applications? Yes. Yeah, and we, we actually do. So um, originally you only had a cloud instance available, so there's a lot of stuff available. In particular, there is not XOR installed by default, but the test can do whatever it wants to the VM. So we do have tests, for example, for the install or Unity, which basically install all the desktop bits and then configure the dummy export driver so that you can start LightVM, you can start Unity, and then maybe get the, the, the screen done and make sure that it works. And we do have tests for uh, testing GTK, or you can use Selenium for using browser tests and whatnot. So that actually works rather nicely. And we do this. 
But of course, it's, it's limited to what you can do with um, like the, the, the dummy driver. So you can't rely on an actual graphics card. There. So in order to do that, I mean, we do have use cases. We, for example, would like to run kernel tests or actual tests on an actual media machine, actual API machine. And we did talk about this. And in principle, so we even have a plan how to implement this so that tests can declare, I need to run on actual hardware, but we didn't implement this yet. So this would require setting up real IM machines, like with, with Mars or in the Reddit World satellite, so basically that you can automatically interact with real IM machines and then run tests there. We are just don't currently have the capability, but the, like the structure would allow it. So and some tests uh, we will require manual wireless. Uh, sorry? So some tests can be uh, used in the such infrastructure, but require some human uh, interaction. Uh, yeah, so this is like anything which uses human interaction, like a test which uses human interaction, this is obviously not the target group here. I mean, uh, this is not solving every kind of test case that you might have, but for the majority of bits, you should actually try to run your test suite so that it runs automatically. So there is, for example, autopilot, which can test uh, desktop applications in a non-interactive way because humans don't scale, right? But I mean, there will always be these kinds, and it's just out of scope, by the way. Okay, well then, thank you, I guess. Yeah?